I'd like to begin as we start a passage of scripture. It's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. There are many occasions for us to rejoice. Birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, uh, graduations. We all like to rejoice. But how about weeping? <laughs> what causes us to weep? <laughs> death. Hurt. 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 Death. Yeah, hurt. That's right. Divorce. Abuse. Just name it. And especially for children. We're talking about children. Do they hurt too? Oh. <laughs> and, and what is so amazing to our children, the hurt they experience in childhood days will, can stay with them throughout their life. It can define their whole life. Um, there's a book written by a Catholic, uh, John Powell. Why I'm Afraid to Tell You Who I Am. Anybody has heard of that book? Oh, yeah. I've read it. Yes. <laughs> and the, the thesis of that book is, if I tell you who I am, you may not like me. And that's why we all wear what we call mask. And I like to take a little risk and take off my mask. Ten years old, I hit a devastating experience. At ten years old, my mother died. I was just, uh, I was born out of wedlock. It was a lot of pain. My mother died, and that became a Waterloo for me. And of course, to the society in which I grew up in, they said, well, little boys, little kids, you don't cry. You must be a man. So I took out my handkerchief and dried my tears. And every time any discussion about my mother, I just blank out. So today I have a mental block about who my mother looks like. It was most painful. Plus, I had no dad. Because my dad, I heard, he said I wasn't his child. So that brought a lot of pain. So the concept about God as our father, as a child, whew, don't tell me about God. That pushed a lot of buttons for me. I said to myself, God is like a father. And how my father treated me, I want to have nothing to do with my God. So that's a little synopsis of what happened to me in those young days. In fact, life became so rough, at, at one point I was even homeless. I seem to skip my teenage years completely. I've had when kids were there playing, I had to be hustling and working. When I eventually reached to high school age, it was like an adult. And they asked if I was a teacher. That shows you how challenging it was. But just to fast forward, sometimes in life, what brings you the most pain? What brings you the most pain, especially in childhood days, could be a defining moment to help you to connect with God. That's what happened to me. Through my pain, I was able to connect with God. Thank God for a teacher, a pastor's wife, that was able to provide love for me. Because the society in which I grew up in, family members, they were very derogatory. They said I wasn't good to pick up or to throw away. And that to me meant it was so devastating. But I thank God for the connection that I had with God, he, he, he provided what we call identity for me. And that meant a whole lot. So what are we saying to us that when we have a God who cares, sometimes there's anger towards God because of who we perceive he is. But when you get to find who God really is, that he's a God of love, wow, it changed your whole perspective. As a child, I was able to find that and that became a path of happiness and joy for me. So we're talking about grief, loss, and we go into loss too many areas. Teresa Rando says that grief is the normal reaction to loss. To what? Uh, to loss. And loss can be anything. Divorce, uh, death, uh, any type of loss that is lost. But I like what Ellen White said in the book, Volume 2, Selected Messages. She says... Those who have borne the greatest sorrows are frequently, are frequently the ones who carry the greatest comfort 
to others. Sometimes your pain can help you to connect with others. If you haven't had a pain, you won't be able to identify. In fact, my wife and I, what a joy it has been for us to minister to children. She has a passion for children, and so do I. And because of our childhood growing up years, the pain we have had, we're able to say, look, what has happened to us with God? We can help others to know that there is hope. Pain does not have to define you. Where can we find hope? And that's what boys and girls are looking for. They're looking for hope. They, I like the discussions this weekend. They're looking for folks who are authentic. They, 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 they don't like fake stuff. They, they want genuine. So I'm going to make a little demonstration here. Richard, could you stand in the middle right there, please? We think about Psalm 23. Where can we find hope? Psalm 23 is a powerful psalm. Here's April, of, I mean, Rachel, I asked her to represent all our boys and girls who are hurting. They're boys and girls who have experienced divorce, they've experienced pain, they've experienced suffering, and they're asking, where can we find hope? They're asking, does anyone care? I, I was there. Does anyone care? Does God really care? And I'm here to say that does, he does care. The psalmist David, and David had quite a journey, didn't he? He says, the Lord is what? My shepherd. And that's personal. He's not somebody else. The Lord is my shepherd. And that means a whole lot. Now, the psalmist says, he leads me. He leads me in the paths of what? Of righteousness. He leads me beside the still water. When someone is leading, where are they? Honey, can you stand right here, please? Yeah. For, for 46 years, she has been my honey. Yeah. She's doing a good job. <laughs> uh, so the psalmist says that he leads us. Sometimes God leads us. Uh, we're talking about our children. We need to, boy, need to know, our boys and girls need to know that God is still the shepherd. Amen? Amen. He leads us beside the still waters. And if I had time, I could describe what the still waters is all about. But what is saying now, God is leading. But then the verse 4 of Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. That rather than stop, they comfort me. Now the question is, when someone is with you, where are they in terms of position? They are beside. Sister Lori, it's a love name. Could you stand right there where you are? Just stand up where you are. Brad, could you stand right here, please? All right? Beautiful. Good. So there we see now. You, are you with me now? The psalmist says, the Lord is who? My shepherd. So our boys and girls, no matter what they're going through, they hurt, the challenges, they need to know that God is their shepherd. That's number one. Number two, his need, they need to know that God is leading wherever they are. They need to know that by their side, God is with them. But then the psalmist ends by saying, Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. When someone is following, where are they? Right there, Margaret, right there. All right, beautiful. What is the picture are we seeing here now? It's a picture of a cross. And cross signifies what? Pain, suffering. Can you think of anyone who does not experience pain in life? In fact, the moment you're born, pie, <laughs> there is pain. But you notice the way of the cross, what? Leads home. But watch this now. Um, it may be a little difficult, but try. Just make, a, make a step, everybody together, make a step forward. Make a step backward. All right? If you had space, you could go sideways too. What is happening now? Rachel is in the center. Can you imagine how she feels? Secure. She feels secure. Why is she secure? Because God is leading all around. All the boundaries are covered. Give these folks a hand. Very good, very good. That's what we're talking about. What this is all about. Our boys and girls are hurting big time. In our society, can you imagine how one feels when a parent dies? I know how I felt. It was devastating. I became angry. I became very bitter. But thank God for my church. My church was there 
very kind, very supportive, to be sensitive. And our boys and girls, they come into our classes as the different ministries that we do have. They need to know that somebody cares, somebody understands. And that's what it's about. I'd like to share with you the process, the whole grief process. Have you heard about Joy Swift? Yeah. Okay. She was a lady. They took a night off, and she and her husband, and they heard sirens. Her four children from 14 to 17 months were murdered, were murdered. Her 17-year-old girl, Stephanie, she had cancer, and 20 days later, she died. Can you imagine how devastating it was? In fact, to complicate matters, they were investigating her that they, they were the murderers. It was a 14-year-old and his 20-year-old accomplice that did the killing. This book, When Death Isn't Fair, sometimes death isn't fair. Sometimes God seems so far away. Sometimes the nights are long. And she, in her book, she has described, I chose her, there are many models you could follow, but her model focuses on what we call the downhill and the uphill. Now, before loss, before that interruption, life goes on. But sometimes one telephone call can change your whole life radically. And in her case, the downhill. Have you seen the uh, sledge, the movie called the uh, Jamaica Bob Sledge? Anybody saw that? You know, <laughs> cool running, cool running. You know, you have the sledge going down. Going downhill, it's exciting. But going back up, it's hard work, hard work. And that's what grief is like. That's what grief, yes, help yourself, please. Yeah. That's what grief is like. So downhill, we have what is called the downhill slide. And first, when there is hurt, there is a state of shock. That's the first stage, shock. I don't believe it. And from shock, we go to denial. No, no, it can't be. And that's how Joyce Swift felt. When I heard my mother died, I, I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I was in a state of denial. No, it couldn't be. Not my mother. I'm young. I'm too young. I, I, not, not me. Not me. Yeah. And we become very angry. Angry. And in my case, I became angry at myself. Became angry at God. Sometimes in intense pain and agony, your relationship with God is in what? Suspense. Suspense. If there's a good God, why? Sometimes we explore the why. And there are no answers for the whys. You could always explore the whys. But I like the next stage that talks about the how. How could your pain help you to connect with others? And that's what has helped me over my, the years in my ministry to allow me to know that, yes, I've gone through the pain, but it's a teaching lesson. Life provides teaching moments, and that's exactly what happened. And so we get in a stage of, of anger. Mm -hmm. And then from anger, guilt. Yeah. Maybe I'm the cause. Mm -hmm. It's because of me why my mother died. It's because of me why my parents are divorced. It's because of me why so many things are happening. And there's the aspect of guilt. And they, we go through all these things. And it, it, the whole journey, the whole process is so complex and complicated. And kids go through that. Sometimes we figure kids shouldn't grieve, but they have feelings just, just like us. So we hit what we call rock bottom, and that's where depression comes in. Depression comes in. And unfortunately, many times individuals get locked in the state of depression. And being depressed is not a good feeling. <laughs> not a good feeling. You don't want the sun to, to, to shine, do you? You don't want to wake up. You just want to stay in bed. Life has lost its meaning and its purpose. And kids go through the whole thing. But the only challenge they have is that they're not able to express themselves as they would like to. They don't have the tools. And that's why sensitive leaders need to understand that behavior, when they behave in a negative way, is not that they want to, but because that's their only outlet many times. Ah, it's a cry for help. It's a cry for help. And we need to read those signs. Need to read those signs. But I've got some good news. Though it becomes a roller coaster, there's hope. And you see this book here? I could tell you stories about this book here. 
This is a precious book. Amen. This is a precious book. It's a sacred book. Yes. I've seen it change lives. I've worked with parents. There's a mother, son committed suicide, and she couldn't go out and shop because she was afraid to meet people. She was afraid to, to live as it was. But the comforting words from this book, the Lord is my strength, my comforter, gave her hope. So there's hope. But what it means, and the hope will climb, the Holy Spirit is there to help. So you notice on the right-hand side, there is adjusting. Life will never be, be the same. It, it's a new norm that boys and girls to have, adjust to. And we as adults, we have to do what? We have to be sensitive to the way they are. They are behaving like they are because it's an outlet. There's a cry, as you mentioned there, a cry for what? Help. A cry for help. So let's not misinterpret those cues. We get those cues. Thank God for a lady who saw I was crying out for help, and she connected with me. When somebody says, Dr. Shaw, I said, who are they talking about? You know, it's amazing what God can do. Right. It's not where you're coming from. It's where you're going. And with God, you can do everything. So there's adjusting. You have to face the reality. Yes, this is a part of life. Pain and suffering, it's a way of life. Ask Job, and he will tell you. And we help our boys and girls to understand that they're not unique. Every one of us, we have to go through a journey. But together, together, we can make it. We are here together. It's like the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. We are the village, we are the school, the school, the church, and the home, all working together. Isn't that good news? But I like this concept about reinvesting. What is it? Reinvest. Reinvesting. The love we have for our parents, the love we have for our loved ones, what will we do with that love? We have to help our kids now to have an outlet. And in my church, we have our kids. I remember when we went there a couple years ago, one boy, uh, two boys, their father just died a few weeks before, and we gave some sort of attention to them. Today, those boys are preaching. Mm. Those boys are active. They are able to reinvest. They, they are looking forward. In one of his sermon, he, he was here last year, he placed a picture of his father and his family and said, we're looking forward to reunite with that again in the kingdom. And that's what we talk about reinvestment, to know that we can give our boys and girls what we call what? Hope. Hope. Give them hope. And the only place of hope is in this book. It's not in the political arena. It's confusing all there right now. The, the, sometimes even the church, there are many challenges. But we need to help our boys and girls to look beyond the pews and to look up to Jesus Christ. Because sometimes many Christians are not as authentic as they should be. We're giving a wrong picture of what and who God is. So the matter of reinvesting and then the aspect of healing. And when you have gone through all that, what a joy. That's what we call the path of recovery. For some people, it may take a few months. For some people, it can take years. I know in my case, the pain I carried was about 30 years. Because many times I tried to deal with my grief. I would suppress it. And when you do that, your stomach keeps going. It's when I was doing my doctoral program, and we did what is called a clinical pastoral education, CPE process that you had to get in touch with your feelings. Mm -hmm. And what a joy it was to get in touch with my feelings and to cry. <laughs> it's okay to cry. Yeah. It's okay to cry. Weeping may endure for what? An eye. An eye. But, ah, uh, isn't that good news? <laughs> and our boys and girls, wherever we are, we need to show our boys and girls that nights don't last forever. Mm. Sometimes the nights are long, right. long, long. <laughs> But joy comes in the morning. And that's good news. And that's good news. That's what we're talking about. Now, we want to get involved. We want to get involved. I'm going to have a little exercise here. Honey, can you help me a place? This side sure. would be uh, group, one and group one and group two here. Let's have uh, Laurie. Laurie, can you come over here, please? All right, good. Now, we just want you to get a feel of what is happening. There are two case studies there. So just read them very quickly. Just form a leader. We're going to take about three and a half minutes, okay? Okay, come a little closer. Come a little closer. Okay, you have two case studies. So we're talking about helping boys and girls through this journey, okay? <coughs> so why you just pick yourself a leader and just read a case study and just share your thoughts. You have about three, three minutes, okay? Kids do experience hurt, don't they? And we have these two cases. What can we learn from these two cases? Okay, let's take case number one. All right. All right, who is the spokesperson here? What, what? 
All right. <laughs> Do I read it out loud? Yeah, okay, sure. Okay. That's fine. So, okay. Case study number one. Okay, no, no subcommittees now, please. Okay, good. <laughs> I was only six years old, and my, sister, my younger sister had a stroke, and her kidneys failed. I found out by listening to my parents' conversations because I was afraid to ask what happened to her. I was fairly scared. I cried a lot after that. I was worried, and I kept my feelings to myself. My stomach was always in a knot, and I tried to take life one day at a time, but it really hurt. I had to learn a lot of things on my own, and when I was upset, I said to myself, you've got to figure <coughs> out what to do to stop this pain. Harris, Heather Harris, 11 years old. The book is a kid's book about death. That's this book here, right. Good. So, mm -hmm. Heather is going through tough times. List some ways in which caring, committed <coughs> children's ministry leaders could minister and support her. So we said, just listening, just being mm. there, um, asking open-ending questions, not right. being prescriptive, loving on her, trying to find out, is she suicidal? Is she, you know, you know, and just being there to add that support. Mm. Yeah. Good, great, great, she, tremendous. She had a good comment too. Go ahead, let's have it, let's have it. Uh, what's oh, the name now? Um, Maureen. Maureen, so I love the name. Yes, good, okay, good. So I would say never say um, to the person, the child, whatever, I understand when you have never gone through something like that because they tend to ask you, really? Well, what happened? How did you handle it? But if you've never gone there, and it's a big turn off mm. to them because you don't know how right. I feel. It's even, if it's, even if it's similar, you both don't have the same experience because your perspective yeah. and mine may be different. different. And that's why your own pain can provide a connecting link. See, pain again is a gift. That's Good, nice. beautiful, all right, beautiful. So that's the case of Heather, all right, good. Any more points here? Yes. Ah, it's okay to cry. And that allows you to do what? To connect more with her. Because sometimes when I was growing up to crying, men shouldn't cry. Women, you do a better job at grieving than men. <laughs> because of society, society said, look, we have to be, be macho, macho. But guess what? We men cry inside, which is even worse. It's better when you can express it. In fact, somebody said it right, that crying is internal bath. It's like you take a shower. That's what crying does. All right. Let, yes. You like that? Yes. Uh, it, ah, that's right. That's right. Isn't God awesome? So we can cry both on the inside and the outside. So crying provides that cleansing. Yeah. Okay, let's take case number two. Go ahead. Okay. Matthew and Lisa were six and eight years old, respectively, when their mother put them in the kitchen with bowls of cereal, went to the family den, and shot herself. The children found the body and called the neighbors for help. Matthew and Lisa belong to our church family. List ways in which we can minister to them and help them through tough circumstances, the tough circumstances they are facing. So we said, and lots of ideas, but first of all, um, you know, not knowing if there was a father in the, in the picture. Yes, um, there is, yes. And, and so, um, but making sure that they have a safe place uh, for, the, for the family, for certainly the kids, for the family to, to live immediately um, and uh, find support uh, for the father um, specifically. Um, and then... Uh, uh, finding families who would commit to just loving the kids um, and and scheduling that and and to make sure that the kids when they went went together uh, at least for the for the um, foreseeable future um, we said put together a 24 month or longer plan mm -hmm. for connecting with this family because a lot of times you know, in a, in a month or six weeks, our lives go on, mm -hmm. and we're and we're okay, and then they're they're left so that we get lots of attention to them for the first week, mm -hmm. two weeks, month, and then they're alone. Um, and then the the other thing that I wrote down, there may be some other, but um, <laughs> we were worried about uh, making sure that they had good legal support. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because the the family, the immediate family, um, is, is probably not in a position to make uh, rational, logical um, decisions just because they're um, just because this has happened to them. So what else? <laughs> the, the trauma. 
This is from this, this uh, case was from life after loss. loss. Life has to go on, may not be the same. And for Matthew and Lisa, that's devastating. That's heavy duty. That's heavy duty. And I like what we said over here to listen. Listen. We're going to emphasize that more. Listen with your ears, but also with your heart. Your heart. Uh, let me fast for emphatic. emphatic. Okay, I like that. Emphatic listening. That's right. Listening with your heart. Just to fast forward, uh, the husband, the father, got married later on, it was a year or two, which was a blessing. And of course, the kids were involved with extensive counseling too, which was a real blessing, which is a real blessing. But you can imagine these two kids, Matthew and Lisa, in your class, there's need, to, there's need for what? Sensitivity, for compassion, for understanding. And you don't understand until you walk in their own macassan. And in their case, for your mother to have committed suicide, I, I can't imagine what that must be like. Can imagine without proper care, proper support, Lisa and Matthew could be damaged for the rest of their lives. Are you with me? Permanently, permanently. And that does happen, yes. Um, I work in, in the field of, of counseling. Right. So I work now working with elderly people. Right. A lot of them have dementia. Right. But with the clients I'm dealing with, Early childhood trauma, right. such as a parent committing mm -hmm. suicide, right. come and tell me, you know, oh, my father shot himself. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, mm -hmm. in the backyard, one scenario, which in the backyard with a gun and just mm -hmm. blew his brains out. And here they are in their 80s, 70s, right. 80s, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. traumatized yeah. right. That's right. by the fact that their dad committed suicide That's when they right. were young. That's right. That's and right. it really, you know, it's very, it, it's painful. Like, it really hurts. It's painful. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. as a counselor, you sit there going, oh. Yeah. And sometimes they've never really even talked about this to anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you're sitting there with all this going, you know, this is just a lot. Yes, that's right. And you just feel the, 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 the pain and, and how long this has gone on. So if we as ministry leaders can right. address this early on, it'll really help, help these kids from that kind of a painful life. And what they're looking for is support mm -hmm. and love and understanding, and for us to recognize, be vulnerable. That's why when we started, I said, look, I'll take off my mask. I'm not immune to that. I've had my pain. But pain is a gift, because the pain helps me to know that there's a God. You know how many nights I've had sleepless nights? But then I wrestle with God. Remember the case of Jacob? And the boys and girls wrestle, some nights of wrestling. But at the end of the process, you know, yes, there is a God. And, and I'm, I'm just amazed how God is so good to me. For where I'm coming from, for the challenges I've had, I said, God, you're just an awesome God. And with that same faith, I can say to boys and girls as I encounter them, I said, look, you can make it. Don't give up. Hang in there. Let's take this, uh, some guidelines. You all made some very good contributions here. And I'd like to give you all a straight A for that, all right? <laughs> that's all right, that's all right, that's straight A, straight A, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> now, now let's share here general guidelines for talking with children about death and loss. And it can be anything. And, uh, and keep in mind that God gave us how many ears? And how many mouths? Does that say something? Yeah. Especially for children, especially for children. Listen, not just with your ears. I'd like to challenge you a little. Listen with your heart. Put yourself in their own situation, in their own circumstance. And, and your challenge will be, your goal will be to help them know that don't allow what they're going to, to define them. To define them. Life goes on after death after divorce, after any major, major loss. And, but to do this, you must be comfortable with your own grief, your own pain. Kids are no fool. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to be phony. So they want you to be what? The A word? They want you to be authentic. So let them understand, yes, 
I've had my pain. And don't be afraid to share your pain. In a child-friendly context, are you with me? You don't want to overload them. But you want them to be sensitive that, look, you've had your pain. And go back into your childhood days, although it's a far back. Say, look, I've had some rough times. And I like what the, the Andrew in his preaching, you know, be vulnerable and say, yeah. look, yeah, I think wasn't that beautiful? Yeah. Beautiful. Let your kids understand. And as I listened to him, I said, look, I need to interact with my own kids. say, look, and we have had to do that. I said, look, the way we train you, in fact, I came from a very legalistic background, and very strict. And that's how we were brought up. Kids should be seen and not be heard in all those things. Mm -hmm. But today you have, to, you have to be flexible. You have to be flexible. And when I was growing up, there was no flexibility. In fact, my grandmother, she couldn't catch me when in the, in the day. The only time she could catch me was when I'm sleeping. So she would beat me when I'm sleeping. When I, I thought I was dreaming. <laughs> if, today, today, if she was alive, she would be in jail. <laughs> but, you know, that's how they grew up back in those days. And I've had to forgive her for that, you know. But it's a whole process, a whole process. But let's look at these, some of these guidelines here. And uh, we mentioned here to don't, don't underestimate your own setbacks, your own pain. It can be an asset. The evil one is a loser. You think about Job, look what he went through. And when you're suffering, it doesn't mean that you have, you've sinned or because you're wicked. No, look at Job, he was a what? A perfect man. But yet he wasn't exempt. So here we go. Number one, it talks about here that listen. And you know that word, listen? Listen carefully without being what? Judgmental. Kids are very sensitive to that. Right, to Margaret? Isn't that so true? And those of us who are parents, even grandparents, we know that. And they don't forget things. That's why some negative things were said to me when I was a child. And as long as I live, I remember those things, but not with that degree of anger and so on, because I've been able to process that. But these young kids sometimes are not at the level that they can process these things. So they allow the, those things to define them. First one, you missed it. Yes, the first one, okay? Offer your okay. Offer your acceptance of their feelings and behavior. The word behavior, what does that say to you? When someone is hurting, as you talk about Lisa and uh, Matthew uh, and also Heather, when they're hurting, what, how would that affect their behavior? Or withdrawn. Withdrawn, that's right. Shutting down. There are different ways, different ways, right. Sometimes, you know, we would, we would sometimes try to act out in, with anger. Sometimes <laughs> kids can internalize it, uh, which can be quite dangerous. Okay, are we together so far? Mm -hmm. Assure them of their security. That word security is important. In terms they can understand. Assure them. And sometimes we say a lot of things to kids that it doesn't make sense. He passed, for example, someone dies, he passed away. He's gone to sleep. If somebody's sleeping, what do you expect? Gonna They're going to wake up. Somebody passed away, he's going to pass back this way again sometime. <laughs> so we need to say to the kids, your mother is dead. There's a book called The Wounded Healer, Henry Norvin. And his philosophy is you deepen the pain so it can be shared. So don't be afraid. As a chaplain, when I go and talk to individuals about death, I don't say he passed away. Yes, I'm sorry to know that your wife just died. You know, you're deep in the pain so you can share. And the whole idea is you want to get individuals, boys and girls, whoever is experiencing loss, into a position to talk, to talk. Grief express is grief relief as you're able to talk. And that's why when you talk about your own pain, your own loss, it makes it very authentic. Because, in other words, he who feels it knows it. Are you with me? And the more you talk about it, the more you get some relief. And to know that others can connect. Yes, I can hear what you're saying. I, too, have been through there. Yes? Can I sh I'd like to share an experience I had in England <coughs> as a teacher that really woke me up. Um, I had a kid in my uh, third form class home economics, and she was just a pain in the neck. Mm, mercy. 
And, you know, she wasn't really doing a whole lot as a student. And she was always talking and disrupting the class. <coughs> and um, one day, it really got to me. And I said, Diane, you need to stop talking and stop disturbing my class. And she just kept right on. So finally, I said, OK, class, finish up this assignment, please. Diane, could you see me in my office, please? Fortunately, my office was right near by my class, so I could see what was going on in there. So we went in, and I said, Diane, what is going on with you? Why are you disrupting my class? Why are you just constantly talking, getting yourself into problems? And let me tell you, that girl broke down mm. so much. If I had a bowl, I could have caught it with the tears that she shed. Oh. And I said, and she started crying. I went to her and I hugged her and I said, okay, Diane, what is really going on? You need to let me know. And that was when this 13-year-old girl said to me, Mrs. Shaw, my mother and father are about to get a divorce. Yeah. And then I thought, oh my God, I nearly killed this child. And that was when it really hit me how I have to be sensitive That's right. to the behavior of even some of these older kids who I think should not be acting that way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Express your love and care for them in unmistakable ways. And here's where I like to coin the thought, the ministry of presence. Ministry of what? Presence. presence. You like that? Ministry of presence. You know, we call that incarnational theology. In other words, in, if any man be in Christ, he becomes a new creature. And your presence to those who are hurting, it should reflect Jesus Christ. Mm. It's not words. Words are cheap. Words are cheap. What can you say to individuals who have had such devastating loss? Words cannot express what you want to say. But just your very presence say something about who you are. Your presence will help individuals know that somebody cares and that someone is Jesus. That means so much. Incarnational, incarnational. Like, you know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yeah. Christ, that's why we can connect so much with Jesus Christ. When you're going through your rough times, Christ said, look, I understand. I've lived in your flesh for 33 and a half years. Not only that, but he'll be there in, in, the, in the flesh for how long? For eternity. That's why the Holy Spirit is, so, is our comforter. He's our counselor. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He's here, there, and everywhere. But Christ has voluntarily allowed his divinity to be clothed with humanity. So we call that incarnational. Incarnational. All right. What was the whole phrase? When you the, said the ministry of presence. Ministry of presence, right. When so, you said incarnational. Right. So therefore, our presence then is reflecting Jesus Christ. Okay. Our presence. So it's not the word so much. It's just our presence. Yeah, just to be there to provide presence. You know, you can be in someone's company and not say a word, and they feel comforted. Yeah, yeah. Just your smiles, <coughs> just your, a hold of the, the, the hand, mm -hmm. you know, just a pat on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Speak volumes. Sometimes people are hurting so much. Words are cheap. Mm -hmm. Just provide presence. Act in ways that elicit the children's trust. And when children take off their mask, and share with you, don't betray them. Amen. Don't betray them. And adults are really betraying our kids today. Sometimes what we say to our young people, and they get turned off. That's why we're losing a lot of our young people in church. Because right. <coughs> sometimes we're not sensitive to where they are. Sometimes we see their behavior, and they, they may be going through losses and pain and suffering. Yeah. And we misinterpret that and figure, here's how you're supposed to act. You don't understand. So listen to them. Help them to, to express themselves and try to understand accordingly. One more than next thing. Yes. Um, there are two words that as adults we like 
and to help our children say to us, uh, whether we be teachers or parents or whatever. But a lot of us don't seem to think that it's important to say that to them. And it, I'm sorry. Yes. Wow. And I found in more than one experience in my lifetime as a teacher that the moment something happened between me and a child, maybe I got upset. At one point I told a girl, you know what you do for me? Step out of my classroom because you're not going to stay in here and cause confusion. Just step right outside there. And I said, you really are being rude and disrespectful. And um, at the, the following day, she didn't come to school. And I called her parents. Uh, the night I called her parents and talked with them. And I told them what happened in the class. And they sent her, um, the day after, they sent her back to school. I went and searched for her. And I said, you know what? I thought and prayed about what I did and sending you out of my classroom. And I want to tell you, I'm really sorry for how I acted. Mm -hmm. I'm not going back on my, my form of disciplining, but I'm really sorry that I just sent you out of my class like that. That's right. And I'm apologizing. Mm -hmm. And I don't want ever to do that again. Let me tell you folks, her attitude was like a flip. <laughs> And she became one of my best students. Mm -hmm. So those two words, I am sorry, mm -hmm. makes a world of difference. Thank you. Can I make a quick statement? Yes. Just being where they're at. That's what, when we start out with dealing with clients, right. people, right. issues, right. trauma, right. Mm -hmm. being with mm -hmm. them where that's they right. are. That's at. right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's hard, but that's the only way to reach them. Mm -hmm. is to be on their level. Be on their level. That's right. Be on their level. That's right. Where that's right. important. That's important. Answer all questions as honestly as you can. Again, in a child-friendly way. Uh, sometimes in a divorce situation, you know, as best as you can, they're hurting too, just like how the divorced couples are hurting. Kids are also hurting. So they have questions. What's going to happen to me? They're concerned about their security and so on. So you need to give them the assurance and try to be honest with them. Then help them understand that circumstances will not always be like this. And what? And they will not what? The way they do. So the what you're going through now does not have to define you. That's right. Life after, like this topic says, life after loss. It may not be the same, but then life has to go on. Then it takes a, talks about provide an atmosphere of stability in the midst of any changes. Any changes. Now I want to go back to my story. Remember I mentioned to you about my dad. Remember we mentioned that sometimes what causes you the greatest pain in life will be the reason why you'll be in heaven. Mm. I heard I had a dad and I went hitchhiking. Where I was born was the country and so I did what they call a footmobile. There were no taxis. <laughs> There were no taxis, right? There were no taxis or buses, no train. So it was footmobile. So I was here footmobiling. Are you with me? And I was trying to get a ride. So I saw a, a, a jeep coming by, and I waved the jeep. And guess what? It stopped. I was so pleased. I'm getting a ride. And then there was a lady in front and a gentleman riding, driving. Then uh, they asked me my name, Whitford Shaw. Where was it? I was going? I said, I was going to look for my dad. What's his name? Mention his name. And uh, do you know him? No. And so after I asked those questions, there was silence. Hmm. And the lady said, that's your dad. <gasps> he was driving. No way. He was driving. That's how I met my dad. Oh, wow. That's how I met my dad. But you know, praise the Lord, yes. But I wasn't praising him then. <laughs> and he never supported me. And thank God for a wonderful wife. You know, in my growing up years, professional life, I had to deal with that pain. And it's rough. And it started in childhood days from when I was 10 years old. I had all that pain dealing with. But, you know, I'm glad for the God we serve about forgiveness. And I was able to connect with my God. I said, God, I need you. And with my wife's help, 
say, look, I have to forgive my dad for all what he did to me. And with their help, I was able to write him a letter. I said, Dad, at all the significant points in my life, you've never been there. When I was from high school, you expect to see your dad. You know, you go to a ball game, you want your dad to take you. There all the things that kids want, boys want to be their dad, nothing. So college, not there. You know, you're getting a doctoral degree, you figure their dad would be there to support you. No. Was being ordained, he wasn't there. All the, at my wedding, he wasn't there. It was painful. I said, Dad, it was, has been difficult. You allowed me to grow up on the rough side of the mountain. As a child, I had to uh, go through all this pain. But I said, I want to thank you for allowing me to connect with my Heavenly Father. And because of what you did and how you treated me, it helped me to be dependent on God. And I want to say he's a wonderful God. He's an awesome God. And because of that, I can reach out to you. And guess what? We started a Bible study. A Bible study. And I was able to share with him the God who has helped me to forgive him. The God who has helped me to love him. And what was my most painful experience growing up became one of the most joyful experiences in my ministry. The day he decided to get baptized. And not only only that, but my stepmother. I was able to have both of them into the pool and baptize them. Three months after that, my dad died. Now my stepmother, every day she calls me. She now lives in Toronto. Every day she calls me to see how I'm doing. My other siblings are getting to know God. So what sometimes becomes your greatest pain can bring you the ultimate joy. So now I can look forward to see two fathers in heaven. Come on now. Come on now. eh? To see my heavenly father. And to see my daddy, that's going to be exciting. I want to close off this section with Revelation 21, verse 4. It says, no more tears. You know what brings us to tears? No more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. Isn't that good news? Yes. Questions? I was going to make a comment about the book you were talking about. Yes. Death isn't fair. Is it L- yes, that's right. You mean um, Joy Swift, yes. Isn't when death isn't fair. Isn't that the case where the woman, at the end, she ends up visiting the boy? Yes, Bobby. Yeah, that's, right. That's, right. Her, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Bobby. Family. Yeah, that's right. These so, young men killed her entire... Right. Four of them. Yeah. So all her children yeah, while that's her, right. she was on a yeah. date with her husband. Yes. Oh, so her healing <laughs> yes. is going back into the prison right. and ministering to him right. and forgiving mm-hmm. him mm-hmm. and counseling with him. Yes. And, <laughs> yes. and so right. that's another thing. You're talking about the going down and coming right. back up. Right. Right. That is, I don't... That, I mean, it takes a lot yeah. to do yeah. that. Yeah. That is, it, it, it's an act oh, of God. That's for good. Pardon? That, that book is They're All Dead. Yeah, that's right. That's that's the first book. That's the first book. Are they all dead? But powerful, isn't it? That's a tough book. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I remember that case. Yeah. Yeah. That's the book here, and that's why we talk about reinvestment, reinvesting. And in my, in my case, I was able to reinvest with my dad. And when you're, yeah. Yeah. You're saying what the thing that would keep me away from heaven is what's bringing me to it. Ah. Now that's, yeah. That's deep. That's powerful, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. Isn't God awesome? He can take our pain and the evil one would think that I got him. No, you don't. You don't. So pain is a gift from God. In fact, there's a book written by um, uh, this fellow here, Philip Yancey. Philip Yancey. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he talks about the gift of pain, the gift of pain. Powerful. And he, Philip Yancey wrote, where's God when it, when it hurts? Where's God when it hurts? And also Dr. Bland and Dr. Yancey wrote a book together, The Gift of Pain. Yes, right. Good. Any more questions? Mm. What our boys and girls are looking for, they're looking for us to be authentic, whatever we do. Let's be faithful in our assignment. Can you imagine what it means to a boy and girl? A pathfinder meeting is called, and the pathfinder leader is not there. A Sabbath school class, junior, primary, or whatever, and the teacher is not present. Imagine Lisa and Matthew at that class, or Heather 
and the teacher's not there. I'm not prepared. They come, there are some teachers not taking seriously what they're doing. We have, Advent Source has so many resources we can use. Yeah. There's no need for us to say we don't have the time with the resources. It's there. And what God is asking for is not so much about our abilities. You don't need to have a Ivy League degree to connect with boys and girls. All you need is a heart, a loving heart, a caring heart. And that's what they want to see. They, they want to see that you authentically love them and care for them. And that you're not, say, a way up there in the sky. Are you with me? They need to know that you are hurting just like them. You have gone through your hurt. And where do you find your hope? We need to help our boys and girls do that. And if we could do that, it's going to make a better world.